Listen to me, listen to me. I will never be able to afford a house. I will never be able to afford a house. House that is one hundred ninety-five thousand dollars back in '96 is now worth like five to seven hundred thousand dollars. My children will never be able to have the life I live because I can't afford to do it. I don't think any of us thought when we were growing up that owning a home would be a luxury. Part of the reason why social life here in America is getting more and more difficult has to do with the fact that nobody can afford decent housing. Everybody in America kind of knows, like, it's over. Hey guys, I'm Hannah Cox with Base Politics. Welcome back to my show, Hannah Explains It All, where I help you understand how things got broken and what you can do about it. If you find this video helpful, be sure to share it with others, like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Social media is awash with people claiming they will never be able to afford a home, pointing out that the middle-class homes they grew up in are now astronomically expensive and that wages have not kept up with the times. Is that true? Let's take a look. How much of a house can you afford if you make $70,000 a year? We're well, gonna take your $70,000 and multiply that by 40%. That's the typical debt to income ratio a lender's gonna use when qualifying you. So that's 28 grand divided by 12 months gives you $2,333 of a monthly allowance. So if you have no debt, you could afford a payment of 2,333. But if you do have debts, credit card, personal loan, student debt, car, let's say you have $400 worth of debt, that's gonna bring you down to $1,933 a month. But what's in that is your principal and interest, property taxes, homeowners insurance, and private mortgage insurance. So with that number, you could afford $225,000 for a house. So as he says, if you make $70,000 a year and you have $400 in debt, you should easily be able to afford a $215,000 house. But there's a lot of problems there. First and foremost, most Americans do not make $70,000 a year. In fact, the national average salary is only $60,575. And the median salary is even less than that, which is what the majority of people would actually make. It comes in at $56,420. Also, most Americans have quite a bit more debt than a mere $400. And on top of all of that, you can't really get that many homes for $215,000. In fact, the national median for housing prices was $387,000 as of November 2023. Now, I wanted to play around with this briefly, so I decided to look at Zillow for my area. I live in Atlanta, and I put a few parameters on the filters. First, I said that we would only look at houses that were $200,000. I said that it had to be a house, a townhouse, or a condo, not merely just a piece of property. I put in a limit of $400 a month for an HOA, which is a lot of money, but that is about what the average around Atlanta is. And then I drew a parameter based on the neighborhoods where people would actually live in Atlanta based on safety and just basic commute time to get to the majority of jobs. And as you can see here, the number of options you have once you put those parameters in place are slim to none. Compare that to the amount of houses that are on the market in Atlanta without these kinds of parameters in the same area. So all that to say, you're not crazy. The odds are you probably cannot afford a house right now. Unfortunately, though, the majority of people I see complaining about this online are blaming everybody but the true culprits for the problem. Like, you guys are worse than police at solving economic problems. I see people blaming greedy landlords. You want to know why greedy, rich landlords suck? Their parents, late-stage capitalism. But yeah, late capitalism is just short for late stage capitalism. BlackRock, take your pick. Everybody but the politicians and policies that have actually created this problem. And as I've said for some time, if you don't take the time to understand the root cause of problems, you're always going to have really bad ideas about how to solve them. So here are the top four things you should actually be blaming for the housing market crisis and what you can do about them. First and foremost, we have a huge housing shortage in this country. In the 70s, we built 11 million homes. In the 80s, 9.8 million homes. In the 90s, we built 10.7 million homes. And in the 2000s to 2009, we built 12.6 million homes. Now 2010 to 2019, 6.5. Now once again, Again, we haven't stopped making people. I looked up some data on this and I found that the National Low Income Housing Coalition says the U.S. has a shortage of 7.3 million units. Realtor.com says 6.5 million. Mortgage finance company Fannie Mae says 4.4 million. Take your pick. No matter who you go with, we simply do not have enough homes for the amount of people that we have in this country. 
It turns out the culprit in this problem was easier to solve than a Scooby-Doo mystery. Exactly as I thought. Blast! Not you meddling kids! This is just basic supply and demand. When you have more people wanting to buy a product than you have of that product, it is going to cause the price to increase. You need to keep in mind just how much our population has grown even in the past 20 or so years. In 2000, we had 281 million people roughly living in the US. That was already a huge increase from 248 million the decade before 1990. Now there's 330 million people living in the US. So what that means is we're not even building enough houses to keep up with basic replacement rates, much less to account for population growth. Now, I think a lot of people do sense that this is a problem, but instead of asking why we aren't building enough houses, they're blaming the people they think are buying up the houses. And that tends to get sort of scapegoated under the company BlackRock. More importantly, there's three giant corporations, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, which own Collectively, they own each other, so it's really one giant corporation. But they also own 89% of the S&P 500. Mm. They own everything. They've now decided to, to buy every single family home in America. People say that because these investment companies are coming in and buying the houses, they're pushing the prices up. But I did some digging, and that's not really accurate. The reality is institutional investors purchased only 3% of homes sold in 2021. And that's the average. It ranged between 2% in some states, and the highest was in Georgia, where they purchased 8.5% of homes. And as this article in The Atlantic points out, 8 or 2% of home sales doesn't mean 8 or 2% of total housing stock. After all, most homes aren't up to sale year to year, and a great majority of homes remain in the same hands. Furthermore, a purchase does not mean that that investor holds the house forever. They often resell them. I can make a full video about this conspiracy theory, but in short, it's simply not true. And what I think is most interesting is that the narrative around BlackRock buying up all the houses seems to actually be tracing back to politicians that are looking for somebody else to blame besides themselves. I'll link some sources in my show notes in case you want to check my facts and let me know if you actually want a full video breaking down this conspiracy theory. Hey guys, Brad cutting in here because we just wrapped another episode of the Based Politics Podcast, my politics podcast that I co-host with Hannah Cox. That's right. This week we discussed Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy coming under attack by both Republicans and Democrats. Plus, Utah's getting sued over a new terrible social media bill. And do you have to pay your debt? We respond to a crazy TikTok. Head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube to join us for the Base Politics Podcast now. But let's get back to the things you actually should be blaming for the housing prices. As I mentioned, housing shortages are probably the dominant reason that the cost went up so much. But that should lead you to the next question, which is, why have we not been building enough houses? And the answer brings me to my second point, which is that it's become too expensive to build homes. And the reason it has become so expensive to build homes has everything to do with the government and policies that they are putting into place. Per usual, when you start overly regulating a market, it becomes very expensive to operate in that market. And ultimately, the cost of that gets pushed onto the consumer. In this case, that's you. If you look at this chart, it shows you what housing development looked like up until about 2007. As you can see, there is a precipitous downfall at that time. It bottoms out around 2010, and it has been increasing ever since. But as you can see, by 2020, we were still nowhere near the highs of 2007 development, despite the fact that our population has been growing this entire time. Raise your hand if you know what correlates with 2007. 2007 is right around the time that the bank started handing out sketchy mortgages to people who couldn't afford them and who had bad credit. And then the bottom fell out and nobody could afford those mortgages and the value of their home prices collapsed. And then there would have been a global recession except for Bush came in and bailed out the banks and then Obama came in and bailed out everybody else except for you. You didn't get a bailout as a taxpayer and nobody went to jail. So yeah, all of that had a major impact on the housing market. It became a lot riskier to build. The government started putting in all kinds of regulations, including things like Dodd-Frank, that made it harder to buy a home or get a loan. And that meant that for home builders, it was then riskier to build because they have to put a lot of cost in up front. They need to know that there will be willing and able buyers on the back end once the product is complete. So ultimately what that led to is home builders deciding to focus more on building expensive homes because they were a sure bet. 
And that's why you have plenty of options if you look at the market typically for homes, 600,000, 700,000, $800,000 and up, but very few below 350,000, which is again, where most Americans is even that could afford to buy. And all of that happened on top of the fact that states and localities had consistently been regulating the housing market and housing development more and more so. They were increasing inspection requirements, increasing requirements on the types of materials you can use to build, all of those kinds of costs add up. And those costs then get passed on to you by the banks, by the home builders, by the insurance companies, by the inspectors, by everybody who is involved in the process. Thanks to all of these regulations, the average amount of time it takes to build one home in the US, one normal family home, is between seven and 12 months. Think of all the labor costs involved in that, not to mention the cost of materials, which have also gone up, especially post-COVID. On top of excessive regulations, there also is a problem of what we call NIMBYism in politics. NIMBYism is an acronym. It means not in my backyard. And basically what you need to think about is just major care and energy. NIMBYs are people, and there are actually a lot of them, who spend their time showing up at city councils and state committee hearings and pushing for things that actually make the cost of housing more expensive. What that looks like are historical overlays and zoning, essentially types of regulations that limit the amount of places that people can build and the way that they can build things. Historical overlays might make sure that pretty buildings stay intact, but old pretty buildings are often inefficient, they are going to rot, they need to be torn down, and we need to be able to use that space to build more efficient housing. Zoning might mean that your house isn't located within a hundred yards of an adult video store. But again, it also means you're going to have to pay a lot more for that housing. That's also might look like regulations on not being able to build up in cities like San Francisco because they want to preserve the landscape. All of these things might make a city look better. They might protect you from seeing things you don't like. But you can't have that and affordable housing. You actually do have to pick. The third reason the housing market became so expensive is simply inflation. All of these problems that I've covered here were happening prior to 2019, and they were steadily getting worse. But the train really came off the tracks in 2020. So the past four years is the problem. This is why millennials and first-time homebuyers are complaining now, because the disparity between 95 and 2019 over 25 years was not that big of a deal. It was, it was moving like it was supposed to. While it is true that wages have somewhat lagged behind inflation, it's more true that what happened in 2020 put us on a death spiral. Ultimately, what you need to actually be concerned with is not how much your salary is, but how much your dollar can buy. As your dollar becomes worth less and less money due to inflation, you can make more money and still ultimately be poorer. And this is where I have to be honest, you might be somewhat culpable for what's happened to you under the housing market. How dare you? If you supported the stimulus during COVID, if you supported all of the additional government spending, extended unemployment benefits, if you supported lockdowns, all of these things are what led to sky-high inflation. Furthermore, if you continue to support things like bailing out student loans, universal health care, free daycare, all of those kinds of programs would simply make the situation worse. Your beliefs are bankrupting you if you are in this camp. In 2020, many of us in libertarian circles and some in conservative circles pointed out that if the government did these things, you would ultimately have to pay for it. As we said, the response could be worse than the disease, and we were proven right in that. I don't want to be harsh here, but if you are one of these people that supports these things, I need you to connect the dots so that you stop shooting yourself in the foot. When Congress votes to spend money we don't have, and I want to be clear, we don't have any money. We are $34 trillion in debt, and it's rapidly rising. The consequence of that is that the Federal Reserve will print those dollars needed. That's because the Federal Reserve has co-opted our money system, took us off the gold standard, and now runs things like we are in a game of Monopoly. But ultimately, you will have to pay the price for those decisions. The government cannot just spend, spend, spend into oblivion and nobody have to pick up the tab. The good news is this picture actually can be turned around and a lot of it can be done locally and at the state level. But in order for that to happen, people need to take all this angry energy that I'm seeing online and direct it at the right sources. You cannot keep supporting progressive economic beliefs. You cannot keep being a NIMBY. You need to push for deregulation so that we can build more houses. You need to push back against NIMBYs and insist that we get rid of ridiculous regulations on where and how people can build. And perhaps most importantly, you need to start making sure your federal representatives know you don't want to see any more government spending programs. 
All right, guys, I hope you liked this video. Leave me a comment. Let me know what your first house cost and what it's worth now. I'm very curious. Again, if this was helpful, be sure to share this video with other people who might enjoy it. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. If you like this video, you can catch the first episode of my series, Hannah Explains It All Here. And don't forget to check out my show with Brad Palumbo, the Base Politics Podcast.